Thank you, and good evening. Let me begin by saying how delighted I am for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. And I also want to thank Austin Dacey for his willingness to join in the discussion tonight. By the way, I uh, hear that the word is out on campus that uh, between the two of us, Austin Dacey is hotter. Um, <laughs> now, that may be the case, but uh, <laughs> all I can say is this, I'll bet you my wife is hotter. Um, so, having begun the debate on that elevated note, uh, we now want to uh, ask whether God exists. Now, in order to answer that question rationally, we've got to address two further questions. First, what good reasons are there to think that God exists? And secondly, what good reasons are there to think that God does not exist? Now, I'll leave it up to Dr. Dacey to present the evidence against God's existence. In my opening speech, I want to sketch briefly six lines of evidence that weigh in favor of God's existence. Number one, then, God is the best explanation of why something exists rather than nothing. This is the deepest question of philosophy. Why is there anything rather than nothing? Experience teaches that anything that exists has an explanation of its existence either in its own nature or in an external cause. You see, anything that exists is either one of two types. The first type is something that exists necessarily by its own nature. Example, many mathematicians believe numbers and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily without any cause of their being. The other type is anything that has an external cause of its existence. Examples, mountains, planets, galaxies, people. They have causes outside themselves which explain why they exist. Now, it's obvious that the universe exists. It therefore follows that the universe has an explanation of its existence. But what sort of explanation is it? Well, it seems plausible that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. Why? Because the cause in this case must be greater than the universe. Think of the universe, all of space and time. So the cause of the universe must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical and material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description, either abstract objects, like numbers, or else an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the explanation of the universe is an external, transcendent, personal cause, which is what everyone means by God. Number two. God's existence is implied by the origin of the universe. The atheist could try to escape the argument I just gave by saying that the universe exists necessarily by its own nature. But this second argument blocks that escape route. For anything that exists necessarily must exist eternally. Think about it. If a thing came into existence or ceased to exist, then we know that its non-existence is possible. That is to say, it doesn't exist necessarily. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the Big Bang. As the British physicist PCW Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe as discussed in modern science 
is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but the literal coming into being of all physical things from nothing. This description holds not only for the standard Big Bang model, but also for quantum gravity models, like that of the famous physicist Stephen Hawking. Hence, Hawking reports in his book, The Nature of Space and Time, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Not only does this imply that the universe is not necessary in its existence, but it also raises the inevitable question, why? Why did the universe come into being 13 billion years ago? What brought the universe into existence? Well, unless you're willing to say that the universe just popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing, there must be a transcendent cause beyond space and time which created the universe. Thus, from one, everything that comes into being has a cause, and two, the universe came into being, it follows logically that three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, it must be personal as well. We've already seen one reason why this cause must be personal. Let me give another. How else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the sufficient conditions were eternally present, then the effect would be eternally present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and the effect to begin in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. And thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number three. The fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life points to a designer of the cosmos. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy or the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow, I mean, I cannot convey to you how almost infinitesimal this is, an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. For example, if the atomic weak force or the force of gravity were altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life-permitting. Now, there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine-tuning. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. So, could the fine-tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the fine-tunings occurring by accident 
are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. The probability that all the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. So if the universe were a product of chance, the odds are overwhelming that the universe would be life-prohibiting. Hence, too, the fine-tuning is not due to either physical necessity or chance. But logically, that implies three. Therefore, it is due to design. Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number four, objective moral values are plausibly grounded in God. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. By objective values, I mean values which are valid and binding whether anybody believes in them or not. Many theists and atheists alike agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in this way. Michael Roos, a noted philosopher of science, explains, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something. Ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? And like Professor Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. On the atheistic view, some action, say rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, one, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just a socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. And here Dr. Dacey agrees with me. In his book, The Case for Humanism, co-authored with Louis Vaughn, they state, if a moral theory sanctions, say, the inflicting of undeserved and unnecessary suffering on innocent children, we must conclude that something is very wrong with the theory. Indeed, even Michael Roos himself admits the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Hence, I think we all know, number two, that objective values do exist. But then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists.